God bless you. You are welcome once again to Breaking Scriptures, where we do some Bible studies online, very classical Bible studies, in a way that, you know, we present the Holy Scriptures in very, very simple form, just to aid you to, not just to understand, but also to make sure that when you have to study on your own, you don't find it difficult to be able to flow and for your spirit to retain the inspiration you catch by the help of God. God bless you. Now, uh, don't forget, the whole essence of this is to make sure that you grow, okay? You grow as a Christian. And in this series, we've been looking at the book of Ephesians. The last time we stopped at Ephesians chapter 2, as we considered verses 1, 2, and 3, and by way of uh, review, our conclusion from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 3 was, uh, that we should be active in spirit. We should be so strong in spirit such that our conduct as Christians, our behavior, the way we ex exercise our Christian, you know, virtues and faith, they are free from what's going on on the streets. The Bible talks about the prince of the power of the air. And so we understand that when we are strong Christians, filled with the spirit, we are not under the control of the forces in the environment because we are active in spirit. To be active in spirit, you know, implies you are always filled with the power of the Holy Spirit constantly to the point the flesh has no dominion over you. So we'll continue again today from that Ephesians chapter, from that Ephesians chapter 2, and I'd like us to look at verses as you know, from verse 4 to, see, let's take from verse 5 to verse 11. But the focus of our discussion today is how to experience the grace of God through faith. We'll be looking at the subject of, you know, Gentiles and Jews, those who are near God, those who are far from God, and how our Lord Jesus Christ connected uh, both those who are near and those who are far off by himself through himself, to the Father, through the subject of grace. Don't forget, let's experience the grace of God through faith. Let's exercise faith in the grace of God. I'll read verse, verses 4 to 10 of Ephesians chapter 2. The Bible says there, But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Verse 10 says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That we should walk in them. Now, the first emphasis that I'd like to make here is the way the Bible, first the Bible says in verse 4 that God is rich in mercy, is full of love. And there's a reason for that. The reason for his abundant mercy is because we'll also need it. We are in an environment where sin is natural. We were born into sin. Trespasses are like daily. So the mercy of God also has to be abundant. Now, the Bible now says in verse 5, even when we were dead in trespasses, Christ made us alive with him. Now, hear this. Don't feel, uh, I'm explaining Ephesians 2, 5 now. Don't feel that you are out of control when it comes to walking in spirit, when it comes to being active in spirit. As a Christian, you need to understand you can undo sin. You, you have the power to undo sin. Uh, you, and you know that if you don't do that, there's a penalty for that. But because God is rich in mercy, he's patient with us. But the first thing I want you to please see there is that even though you may still feel like doing the wrong thing, commit, you know, cheat people, um, not uh, lie, okay, <laughs> lying rather, 
and uh, not being sincere, you know, common ones like um, sin or sex, fornication and all of that. I'm suggesting here, the Bible says we were dead in trespasses. You were an old man when you were doing those things, but now you have been made alive in Christ. So that is telling you that you are not controlled and overwhelmed by sin anymore. So feeling like committing sin, still falling into temptation, does not mean that that is the permanent way you live as a Christian. You already are alive in Christ, which means that you have the authority, the power, the strength to overcome sin. And God will help us in the name of Jesus Christ. Okay, uh, the bottom line to that is, you are so conscious of the wrong conduct outside Christ. Now, you don't want to do it. Now, still on um, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6 says, And he raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, the way I'll interpret this is to understand that the resurrection of Christ, the Bible says, he raised us up together. Ephesians 2, 6. When Christ raised us up, what he's suggesting is that his resurrection from the dead gives us an assurance that we have the power to live as Christians. Such that once anything is going to you know, put you down, condemn you, you know that you are already positioned above condemnation. It's like if a car runs into a ditch and you have all these pulling vehicles, a truck that can pull it out. Whatever mess that we were in, because Christ resurrected and he raised us, God the Father raised us up with Christ, you can be sure that whatever force that holds you back, whatever messed life you have lived before, the resurrection of Christ already lifted you out of that. I, I mean, it's key. It, it, this is so important. I, I, I remember the story, a <laughs> very popular, uh, funny story of a woman where uh, a woman that um, someone wanted to give a lift on the road. She was carrying this log of wood on her head. And when the truck driver stopped to give, him, to give her a lift, the old woman carried a log of wood <laughs> into the seat and still sat inside the car with the wood on her head, log of wood on her head, rather than put the load in the trunk, okay? Sometimes we're like that. After we have been raised together with Christ, we still feel condemned in our heart. We still carry this burden as if we are not free from trespasses and sins. We still remember the old things we used to do and they still put guilt on us. I want you to please be reassured. As Christ was raised, as he resurrected, just like the example I gave, pulling a cart of a ditch, you are already out of every form of condemnation. Okay, so don't forget, we are looking at how to exercise our faith in the grace that God gave through Christ when he raised Christ from the dead. That's our focus. Still in that Ephesians 2, verse 6, the Bible says again, he raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, the question is, how do you demonstrate that you were raised together with Christ? What gives you the confidence that you are operating in spirit? What gives you the confidence to call on God to exercise your supernatural powers? What gives you the confidence to have dominion over demons? What gives you the audacity to send angels on errand? It's a simple thing. You were raised together with Christ. Once we understand that, we are bold and confident to exercise our powers as Christians. And we also need to get this established. One of the ways by which we do this is to have, you know what to call, baptism, baptism in water by immersion. When you are baptized, we demonstrate the fact that you were buried with Christ. When you are pulled out of the water where you were immersed, we also demonstrate the fact that you were raised with Christ. That psychologically, spiritually speaking rather, that 
uh, is a spiritual depiction of the fact that old things, the old self, how you used to live, they are gone. And why is this important? As long as you don't see yourself as a new creature, a new being, as long as you don't feel like all things are passed away and they are buried with Christ, as long as you don't see that you have come out a newness of life, that you are a new being, you were raised with Christ, if you don't see that, you will still allow the devil to cheat you. You will still allow sin, the thoughts, the way you used to think, you know, that put yourself down. You still allow sin, your thought to dominate you with sin. You will still not feel confident and strong enough to cut off whatever wants to put you down. So please get this into your confidence. You have been raised together with Christ. You, you were dead. Everything about your past life, they are gone. The you that used to lie, they were that part of you is buried with Christ. The you that will cheat, that part of you is buried with Christ. The you that will, you know, swindle, that part of you is buried with Christ. The you that will, you know, uh, offend people, you know, with venom in your words, the way you speak, that part of you is buried. You have been raised as a Christian, raised together with Christ, you have a new mindset, you have a new understanding. I pray that God will clarify this more and more for you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So we we'll read further from Ephesians chapter 2 and I'll read verse 6 again, where the Bible says again, God made us sit, sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I, I also explained um, the significance of being seated in spirit. Basically, it depicts a position of authority. When a king sits on his throne, it's not the throne that matters per se, but the authority the king wields, the, the status the king represents, the power, the influence it can exercise where it is seated. And that's very key. So when the Bible says, Christ raised us as he died, he also raised us from the dead, which means that anything that is not approved by the Spirit, anything that the Spirit does not want, we don't to do anymore. And I want you to be excited about that. You just find yourself you used to smoke, you used to drink, those things are gone. Like I said, you used to lie. It's not easy for you. You are now conscious. You see, this is the difference. When the Bible says we're dead in trespasses, the implication is that when you do something wrong, you don't even know the difference. You don't even know that you are wrong. But when you have been made alive, you know the difference. Even when you want to still do something wrong, there's a conscience in you that tells you you are wrong. So you stop it. That's what it means to be raised to Christ, to be alive in Christ. And so the Bible is saying that after that, you are now seated with Christ. Ephesians 2, 6. You know what that tells us? It gives us a position of authority and why it is possible to, to have dominion over demons. Why you can tell sickness to go. Why you can command poverty to go. Why you can deal with the spirit that lures you into illicit drugs. All those things that are not right. Where you can rebuke sickness. Where you can tell them to go. The reason is that you are seated. Don't forget, where Christ is seated it's not just in heavenly places, but it is far. A sitting position, a seat of authority and throne, is far above principality and powers and dominions and every name. We read that from Ephesians chapter 1 at previous sessions. But where I'm going is this. You can control, you can command rather demons. You can also command angels to execute whatever you want God to do for you. You have the authority. Why? You are seated. Why did I include angels? Because the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 13, that which of the angels of God did he tell? Which of them did he tell? Sit at my right hand. Which means that God does not tell angels to sit, okay? And that sitting position is the position of authority. In that Hebrews 1 14, it says the, the angels are sent forth. Okay, we, 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 we ask them to execute God's promises for us. Please, this is where, you, you need to be excited about this. This is where you have the 
scriptural reference for your spiritual authority. You are seated with Christ far above principalities and powers. You can trample on the foot. You cannot be dominated by sin, by sickness, by evil thought, by wrong emotions. Those things are gone. All things are gone away. You, now, this is the way it goes. Imagine a king, a proper king, not just a local insult or by the, the king of a major country. I don't want to mention names of country now. Now coming to Nigeria, just seeing a lady on the road now doing a cat call. Hey, s -s -s -s, come, come, come. It, it, it does not befit the king with your protocol and all of that. When you see yourself in your new state of the spirit that God has honored you, sitting within, you do not commit sins on the street like you are an ordinary man. You are seated with Christ. You have royalty in your system, in your blood. Please develop that mindset that you are someone that God has honored and elevated. Uh, and that should excite you. My prayer is that your understanding will come to you with clarity in the name of Jesus Christ. Okay. Now, in verse 7 of that Ephesians 2, the Bible says that in the ages to come, it might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. In the ages to come, in the ages to come, it might show the riches of his grace. Now, we talked about the prince of the power of the air from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 uh, at the last session. And I did say that that is like a spiritual force that, you know, make us do what we don't intend to do. Affects the way we talk, the way we like, the addressing, you know, um, our motives, direct us, you know, our emotions and all that. There's just something in the air. Like the Bible talks about the man Lot, that because he was in an environment where sin, sodomy was high, same-sex marriage and all of that, where it was high, it was affecting his soul. Now, why is this important? The Bible says in that verse 7 that in the ages to come, God will show the riches of his grace. You know what that tells us? Before we are forced to do the wrong things, the grace, the mercy. Remember we started from verse 4 in Ephesians 2 that we're looking at. It says God is rich in mercy, in grace, in mercy and in his love. You know, now it says in verse 7, it's also rich in grace. That so that before we have challenges, before we become influenced by wrong negative forces, the grace to overcome them was already available before we commit trespasses against God. And that is, that is, that is powerful. That is very, very powerful. It says in the ages to come, the riches of God's grace was already provided up front in advance. Before we were born again, the grace to get us saved was already waiting. When you do anything wrong, rather than backsliding, the grace to restore you from sin and trespasses, that grace is already waiting. All our friends and family members who are not yet saved, God in the ages to come, all the pressures that the society will be putting on us, whether it's the pressure of 66, whether it's the pressure of, you know, um, what are some of the things you know, that we're very concerned about, you know, uh, the mark of the beast, the pressure of, uh, well, I don't know, I can't remember an example now. Whatever is going to happen, the pressures on the street that make marriages fail, the pressures on the street that make people deny Christ, the pressures on the street that make people get greedy, that they don't want to give anymore, the pressures on the street that make people break covenant. It says in the ages to come, when the pressures are rising on the streets in the society, forcing your Christianity to become weak. Mm. God is also rich in grace. Graces have also been available in a way you live in triumph. May the Lord keep you strong as a Christian in the name of Jesus Christ. Okay. Now, I would like to ask a question. From that verse 7, where the Bible says, God wants to show the riches of his grace 
in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. The question I'd like to ask is, why do you think God gave us a new life in Christ? Why? Why do you think he gave us the grace to be saved? I won't respond to that immediately. Maybe at the next session we can look at that. I'll leave that with you. I just want to be sure that you are getting into this. I want to be sure you are meditating on what, you know, the Spirit is eliciting. Okay? Now, I go further in verse 10 um, of that Ephesians chapter 2 that we read, where the Bible also says, For we are his workmanship, his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for, please know that, for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are his workmanship. I want you to see something there. Where is workmanship? Um, just imagine a woodsmith, those who carve wood. They just get a log of wood and they begin to carve it and carve it and carve it. Before you know it, the sculpture a shape. Maybe they have a, mind, a man in mind. They sculpture it to a man. If it's a woman, they sculpture it to a woman. Now, before God saved us, he already had grace waiting. And the Bible says, where it's workmanship created for good works. Now, the first thing I'd like to know that, note there is, we were not created by good works. It is not our works that got us saved. God got us saved so that through his transformation in us, it will be, it, it, it cannot show the world what it can make of people who cannot make themselves. He says we're created for good works. Okay, so God changes us, saves us to transform us so he can show forth how good, how kind, how loving, how gracious he is. So when he saved us without we pay any price. It's a mark of kindness. When it transforms us out of poverty into wealth, into riches, when it takes us from people who had no direction and we're excited that we can make something good out of our lives, we are showing forth God's works. He says it's for good works. We are his workmanship. We are what God wants to use to show the world how good he is. That's what he's saying here. And, and so that calls for appreciation that God brought you and I into Christ to show forth his goodness. I think we should appreciate him for that. Before we continue, can you just take one minute and say, Father, thank you. Thank you for your grace in my life. Thank you for your kindness in my life. Thank you for transforming my life. Thank you for picking me from the merry clay. And thank you for giving me the confidence and the courage to be able to forge ahead and make something good out of my life. We bless the name of the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I would like you to please meditate again on verses 4 to 10 of that Ephesians chapter 2 that we read. And uh, I would like to leave you with a question. Now, the question I'd like to ask you is, what happens to us as Christians when we place our faith in Christ? Don't forget. The charge today is to exercise your faith in Christ. Now, when you place your faith in Christ, from that Ephesians 2, verses 4 to 10, what are, what are all the benefits? What are all the consequences? What are all the blessings that come when you exercise faith in Christ? When you draw the grace to be saved, what do you gain from there? Now, while you are thinking of that, I would like you to, first of all, again, Let's celebrate the fact that we are God workmanship. A, a workman as the product of his uh, productive exercise to show a manufacturer is a workman. You bring your product to the marketplace. God projects us. God transforms us. He shows the world what he can make of us. I want us to just appreciate it. And now ask him, according to verse 10, it says, even though we're God workmanship, it says, which God prepared beforehand, verse 10 of the Ephesians 2, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Can we just use this to pray and say, Father, show me new ways to draw more and more of the grace you have prepared ahead of me. God is saying here, it will transform us. Whereas workmanship, it wants to showcase 
He used it to showcase what his grace can do, how it can prosper somebody who was poor, how it can make somebody who was single to be a family person and responsible, how someone who has not fruit of the womb, how the grace of God can help them, whatever it is that you want. How someone who is directionless, how you can actually have a you know, clear purpose in life. It says, God prepared all of this before and. You are his workmanship. He wants to transform you, but what he will use is already prepared. So while you are praying, ask him, Lord, show me, reveal to me new ways, more and more ways by which, Lord, I can draw the grace you have prepared ahead. He has prepared some things beforehand. How do I draw these blessings? Lord, reveal them to me. Reveal them to me more and more in the name of Jesus Christ. I'll give you one more minute to pray for that. New graces that are waiting for you. New opportunities in Christ. Whatever you need to do, whatever you need to know, so that you can continually enjoy the favor of God, the mercy of God, the kindness of God, the grace of God, the things that God has prepared before and that. Lord, reveal them to me. Help me to understand how to tap more and more into your mercy, into your loving kindness, into your grace. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. I love to read verse 7 again of Ephesians chapter 2. It says that in the ages to come, it might show, it might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us who believe. You know what I pray for? That the God of all grace will make his grace more evident in your life. He says God wants to show it. He wants to show the exceeding riches of his grace. God is looking for candidates for grace. You will be a major candidate. Grace will multiply with you. Favor will grow with you. The mercy of God will never depart from you. The love of God will continually fill your heart. You will not be under pressure to impress anyone because you are confident that God is already your provider, is your protector, and is the reason you will not stop making progress in life. I pray again that by the mercy of God, you will be rich in grace. You will multiply in grace. The grace of God will be evident upon you. Your faith will not fail in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Once again, I'm excited that you know that you can experience grace because your faith in Christ has never failed. And one of the ways by which you know that grace is working for you is the way you make more money, how you, you know, how your plans work out. And to get that also done, you also have to make sure that you give to God as a sign you have faith. Faith comes before grace. When you demonstrate faith in God by giving to God, then you have the grace to get what you are looking for. May the Lord keep his face shining upon you even as you give to him right now. God bless you and hear this song. Hear this. You will not cry for any form of emergency. I don't know who that is for, but hear the word of the Lord. You will not be under pressure that you will beg any man because you feel that God has deserted you. You will not beg. You will not cry. Whatever it is that you need to resolve, your heavens open up right now. And grace, the riches of God's grace will begin to manifest with you. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you for coming online once again today. Until we meet again, experience open heavens. In Jesus' name, amen.